Good afternoon. We'll start our uh, question and answer session. First, I'd like to thank everyone who submitted questions here today, as well as online on the Coast Guard's website. For the sake of brevity, uh, we may paraphrase some of the questions so we, we can get to as many questions as possible. Our first question, Admiral, on a topic of marine safety performance. The commercial maritime community has complained the last couple of years of a shift in Coast Guard focus from traditional roles, specifically marine safety. A generalization of the complaints is that the Coast Guard is not adequately staffed with experienced inspectors. Additionally, many of the inspectors are junior and inexperienced, especially when compared with the shipmasters, chief engineers, and port personnel that they are regulating. What is the Coast Guard doing to address these challenges? Well, thanks for the question. We've actually been addressing this issue for about 18 or 24 months. And uh, I would just say this, uh, almost the same answer I gave on the acquisition organization. I think we need to look at where we're at today rather than two years ago. We're not where we need to be, but we certainly have thrown a lot of resources and, and put a lot of energy into this uh, issue. Uh, over 300 positions have been added to the Marine Safety Program. We're looking at a blended workforce of uh, OCS and Academy accessions that ultimately move up to become uh, professional marine inspectors. But we're also looking at creating civilian positions for continuity and consistency between the ports. We also look, of course, to our enlisted and our warrant, our warrant to lieutenant program in that middle ground there to give us some bench strength as well. We are creating centers of expertise, focused on the various industry segments, where it's liquefied natural gas, uh, the brown water towboat industry, oil and offshore gas exploration, cruise ships, and so forth, including our merchant mariner credentialing uh, system in West Virginia. Uh, we are putting resources on this. Uh, somebody once told me, you don't make policy to spend money. We're spending money. Uh, I put out unambiguous guidance to the field on how I expect our people to interact with the maritime transportation sector. I've gotten really positive feedback from folks like BIMCO who actually did a survey and told us that it was going the right direction. So I would call it a work in progress, but we need to have you give us the feedback. And I would tell anybody, if you've got a problem, go directly to your sector commander and captain of the port and make the problem known early to them so they can take care of it. Thank you, sir. The next question was asked here today. The topic is environmental protection. Is there any possibility that EPA and the Coast Guard will sign a memorandum under which the Coast Guard will enforce the EPA's vessel general permit? Well, as you know, we're in a little bit of a transition period here right now. We're up against a hard deadline. Uh, we had a lot of court uh, action that was involved in this. Uh, we now have a general uh, discharge permit. I had a very close relation with the last uh, EPA administrator. Uh, I met quarterly, breakfast, lunch, wherever, and to go through these problems. I have no problem at all uh, signing an agreement with EPA and partnering as we move forward on this. Thank you, sir. The next question was also asked here today. The topic is Loran. The President's budget overview proposes eliminating Loran, which will leave the nation without a primary backup for GPS. What problems do you foresee if ELORAN is not funded and deployed? I'm going to make a distinction between operating LORAN and a backup for GPS. While one could be the other, it doesn't necessarily have to be. The policy decision was taken to terminate LORAN C. Negotiations, discussion, and outreach to stakeholders will continue on the requirement for a backup to GPS. Should that backup become ELORAN, that's something that can be addressed in the future. Uh, we have vacillated for years on Loran C. We have stations in Alaska that are operating with 1960s vacuum tube technology that have yet to be converted. It is time for an up or down vote on Loran C. It has served this country well. Uh, there's not a maritime navigation requirement for it, but regarding positioning and timing, those requirements need to be generated in the interagency, and the Department of Homeland Security will have the lead on that effort. I would say also, uh, as a former Loran CO in Southeast Asia, I have two vacuum tubes sitting in my office at Coast Guard headquarters. There were the similar ones in my Loran station, Lompong, Thailand, which I closed in 1975 after the fall of Saigon. And those same tubes are being used in Alaska today. Thank you, sir. The next question was asked online. The topic is Arctic policy. Do you envision a return of the icebreaker funding from the National Science Foundation to the Coast Guard in the 2010 federal budget. We were provided guidance with the 2009 appropriation that there should be a fund-based transfer 
uh, between the National Science Foundation and the Coast Guard to sustain ongoing base funding of our icebreakers. Uh, we are currently working that issue inside the administration in advance of the rollout of the budget in April and more to follow. Uh, two more parts to this question, sir. Yep. The, is the economic and budget climate, in the current economic budget and climate, do you see icebreaker funding increasing or decreasing? Well, if I could put the uh, horse before the cart, first we need to stabilize our current fleet and resolve the funding issues between the Coast Guard and the National Science Foundation. Then we, ha then we need to have a requirements development process that takes us to where we need to be for icebreaking requirements in the Arctic. There is a new National Security Presidential Directive that is currently under review by the new administration and need to go to an alternatives analysis for whether or not the current icebreakers can be rehabbed or what to do about potentially new ones. I am more concerned about losing current capability and putting this country in a position where they are at risk and unable to establish presence in the Arctic. So the current icebreaker fleet is my main focus. Sure. And last question on this topic, sir. Do you foresee the return of the polars to Operation Deep Freeze duties or the continuation of the Na National Science Foundation outsourcing it to foreign contractors? Well, the first thing we have to do is resolve the base funding. If we follow the guidance that was provided by the con Congress and remove that to the Coast Guard, I, for one, am in favor of resolving this for good and coming up with a mechanism where we provide the services and National Science Foundation doesn't feel they have to mortgage their base funding or deal with another country or another entity to provide those ice-breaking services. Uh, the Coast Guard should be doing this. Yes, sir. This question was asked here today, sir. The topic is the war in Iraq. In light of President Obama's recent announcement of significant troop reductions in Iraq in August 2010, how will that affect the Coast Guard's shoreside presence in Bahrain and the future of the six 110-foot patrol boats currently operating in the Persian Gulf? Uh, the current discussions are regarding uh, ground combat forces in Iraq. Uh, there's no been, clear there been no clear discussion on what the naval forces out there. The current challenge right now, as you know, is providing security of the oil platforms, which constitute the majority of the GDP for Iraq. Uh, that discussion has not occurred yet. Thank you, sir. Next question was asked online. The topic is recapitalization. Two parts of this question, sir. The first one, how will the Coast Guard learn from the mistakes of Bertoff while building the rest of the national security cutters and other offshore assets? Well, I think I just explained it, but let me give it one more try here. We have a new acquisition organization. We have clearly delineated roles and responsibilities on how we develop requirements, who owns the requirements. We have clear and delineated roles and responsibilities for our technical authorities, which ensure that any acquisition meets the standards and the specifications put forward, and we have acquirers that are partnering to do that. We have a review of the uh, structural issues that were associated with the Bertoff. Uh, they've been reviewed by the Navy. We are in agreement. We can't achieve the, uh, the fatigue life uh, projected with the changes envisioned for the future cutters. I believe the program is stabilized. The best example I can give you of the new organization is the award of our fast response cutter, the Sentinel class contract that survived both a GAO and a court challenge as being properly awarded. Sure. Next part of the question, sir, what is the Coast Guard doing about its other recapitalization needs such as shore infrastructure? Shore infrastructure is a problem. I've tried to push that up as close to $100 million a year as I can. I think we will get there this year because of the money that was provided in the stimulus package. Our challenge will be to sustain that level in subsequent years. But right now, I'm, I'm very satisfied with where we're at at shore that we probably need to look at the out years and whether or not that'll be sufficient. Sure. Next question, sir, was asked here today. It's on departmental leadership. As mentioned in your prepared remarks, there is a new Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, and she has already articulated a different perspective from the previous Secretary. How will this different perspective affect the service's roles and missions? I think uh, the, the Secretary brings a fresh perspective on what the Department does. If, if there's anything unique to Secretary Napolitano, it's her ability to see things from the position of the state and local governments. Uh, she, uh, she came from that community. Uh, she is personal friends with the other governors in the National Governors Association, and I think she brings a perspective uh, of what it's like down, down on the ground, or she, as she says, boots on the ground. She knows what it's like to be the chief executive officer of a state and the implications of federal policy. It's not unlike some of the uh, feedback we get on the cumulative impact of regulations 
uh, lack of continuity on federal policy between states and states' initi initiatives in the absence of federal uh, uh, movement on regulations. Uh, so I, I, I'd say that's a very fresh point of view that she brings to the department, and uh, we, we appreciate it. Sure. Next question was asked online. Topic is seafarer access. What is the Coast Guard doing to ensure that required facility security plans incorporate measures to address seafarers' access to shore leave? We provided pretty clear guidance uh, to our captain of ports and our sector commanders, and I have personally spoke out in numerous uh, meetings, conferences regarding this. If there is a problem with shore leave, this needs to be immediately brought to the attention of our captain of the ports. While sometimes we lack the hard legal capability to force something to happen, our role in the leadership, uh, our leadership position in the ports can make a significant difference, but we have to know that access is being denied in a near real time space and time so we can react and deal with the facilities. Yes, sir. We support Mariner access, I mean, bottom line. Next question, Admiral, was asked here today. It has to do with pay parity with the Department of Defense. Given some of the aspects of the changes in government spending, is the Coast Guard's military compensation package in danger of no longer mirroring the Department of Defense's? Well, our compensation and benefits are established in the National Defense Authorization Act, not in our Authorization Act. So our benefits are the same. Sometimes we have access issues on special programs because they don't clearly state armed forces. They may say DOD, and we have to work those issues. But on pay, uh, it's all laid out in the National Defense Authorization Act. Now, how that is funded within the DOD appropriation, the DHS appropriation, is another matter, and we do seek parity and equity in making sure that is fully funded. So next question was asked here today. The topic is UAVs, and the question is, what is this current status of UAVs for the Coast Guard? Regarding high-altitude UAVs, uh, we have uh, joined together with Customs and Border Protection to create a joint program office within the Department of Homeland Security. I don't see any reason why the Coast Guard should be out in front leading the development of a maritime predator program if we already have one up and operating inside the Department of Customs and Border Protection. The challenge is to create a maritime variant with a sensor that will give us the surface coverage that we need in a high altitude UAV. I think we also have the challenge of coordinating with the Department of Defense and both of us have the challenge of access to airspace and dealing with the FAA and I think there are uh, real opportunities for DHS to partner with DOD in that regard. On vertically launched UAVs, we've had several discussions with the United States Navy regarding their fire scout development, which is going to be the VUAV for the littoral combat ship. Uh, I've, I've agreed with Gary Roughhead that we need to take a look at whether or not the fire scout is a capable VUAV for the national security cutter. And we would even not rule out in the future a composite squadron or some way to joint, make our requirements joint, joint basing and joint deployments. Yes, sir. This question was asked here today, sir. The topic is the size of the Coast Guard. What is the current manpower strength of the Coast Guard, and what is the overall goal? Well, I said last year, and I'm not going to retract it because I said it and I can't take it back, <laughs> that we are capable of growing by 2,000 a year at our accession points without making additional investment. Now, having that capacity, uh, on one hand, begs the issue of whether or not that will be possible in the current fiscal environment. It is clear, and I said many, on many occasions, uh, our, our demand outstrips our supply for services. A decision on how big the Coast Guard should be moving forward, especially in this fiscal environment, is something we're going to have to work with the new administration. Uh, but I will tell you this, and I said this last year, uh, this notion of doing more with less needs to leave our lexicon. You only do what you can with what you've got. And if, if you have mission creep or you have additional demands placed on you, then you increase your risk position of what you don't do, and that's the discussion we have to have. Yes, sir. Sir, this is the last question. If it was asked online, the topic is modernization. How will we measure the success of modernization? If we define our ultimate mission execution as our 11 outcome measures, how will each segment of modernization move our outcome measures in a positive direction? Well, that's an outstanding question, especially for an old budget weenie like me. Uh, here's, here's the deal. Uh, this is a chicken and an egg thing. We can take a look at our performance measures and see how we can get better uh, granularity in what we're trying to achieve and the effect we're trying to achieve. Or we can create an organization that is more responsive and more competent to develop those measures. Uh, I have not been sanguine with our uh, performance measures for several years. Most of them uh, predate 9-11. Uh, 
A lot of them uh, don't accurately indicate what we are doing out there, and a lot of them are dealing with performance that takes place where we don't own the entire environment and somebody else may have an impact on the outcome. My goal would be to stand up the Force Readiness Command, uh, properly allocate functions and responsibilities, and I think for my successor, a real central issue is going to be taking a look at our performance measures and are they adequate and are those the right things we should be measuring.